So uh, in the previous session, we were discussing about how to install the virtual machines and what is the purpose, how we configure using the virtual box. Uh, we initiated the installer of the Linux. So we did all the steps. It will continue with the installation when it's predominantly just the automated steps. It does everything for us. And once it is done, it will reboot and present a login screen. If you noticed during the installer configuration, it would have asked to reset, I mean, come and uh, configure our root password, which is nothing but like an administrator. And at the same time, it asked to create a user as well. Okay. But we will see, we can create the users manually again. I will today, I'm going to show that once you have that booted up, how you are going to navigate, how you are going to create the users, how you are going to administer that environment, that uh, Unix box per se, <clears throat> just like how you navigate in Windows. We, we are lucky in this year, I mean, not in this year, I mean, initially when Linux was there, there was no graphical user interface, it was all character user interface, but it got evolved so much now, most of the things that we can do via graphics. But today, the main focus would be managing that via commands rather than using via graphical user interface. Uh, before that, there was one question that came in in the previous session was about the networking, the bridge and the NAT. I will show how that is being configured, but to give an overview, NAT is something, it is like an isolation environment where you do not have access to your host machine, but guest will have internet access, but anything outside the guest, no one can enter into the guest machine. So you have to always either have a port forwarding or you need to have a bridge network so that you can connect to that box. Uh, so if I go to that configuration, settings as i said when you go to the settings you have an option called uh, network so here you'll have the all four different adapters that you can configure from interface by default adapter one which is our uh, the first network adapter that gets configured where it shows as nat then you can go to the second and you can enable that and you can pick the option called bridge we don't need to do any special configurations other than that. It is basically taking my physical network interface and connecting to it and emulating my bridge adapter so that I will have both NAT and bridge. Now, when we discussed yesterday, not in the last class, the last week session, what the way NAT is basically, you will have, you'll have the box, So this is our host. Then this is my guest, which is Linux. So if this has a NAT, then basically this is my internet via router. So this has connection to internet, but this, this host machine cannot connect to my guest. So no inbound, only outbound. Now to establish this connectivity, what we can do is we can go to the let me clear off this. So we can go to the second adapter and then enable this with a bridge. Now, my machine is already booted, so I'll go to the machine and let me log in. Now here, in Windows usually we use, in order to display the IP configuration, what I would say is, I'll say IP config. So I get my connectivity, the IP, uh, address that has been allocated to my machine has been displayed in the same way in Unix or in Linux, you use the command called ifconfig. So here, if you see the ifconfig, so if, if you look at the adapter settings, 
we have two adapters in the network. We have adapter one and adapter two. So this is for the adapter one and this is for the adapter two. So adapter one is NAT with 10.0.2.15, which has access to the internet, but no one can connect to this machine using this IP address. However, if you want to connect it to this box, then you have to use 192, 168, 121, which is the bridge. Now we can verify that. So this is my host machine command prompt. That's from basically from Windows. Now, if I say ping 10.0.2.15, it cannot, it doesn't know who that is. There is no such IP address to be located. However, if I try 192.168.1.21, then I can ping. Now, if I want to connect, as you all know, uh, I'll, I'll go to that step. I'll, I'll, I want to pause that for a second, how to connect from the host, how to connect from uh, anything outside the guest. Now, uh, so that's what these uh, IP config is showing the two network routes that you can connect to. If you have noticed, there is the naming here, right? This is says ENP0S3, ENP0S8. In cloud or in older systems, it used to say ETH0, ETH1, ETH2, and so on and so forth. But the problem is that the naming convention is changed in the latest versions of uh, Unix built maybe 2015 onwards. I do not remember when this changed, but again, you can still go back to ETH0 by manual configuration. By default, this is what the network adapter uh, naming convention is used. ETH ET means like ethernet, P0 is the uh, bus on your motherboard where it has been connected to S3, S8 are the slots to which it has been connected. So that's how they give this naming convention. Uh, to my knowledge, the reason why they did this change is ETH 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth are defined or emulated based on the drivers at the driver level, not at the physical layer level. But drivers sometimes might change saying that, saying that if if ETH0 is your boot uh, network adapter, sometimes it may get changed to ETH1. At that point, any firewall rules, any uh, automations, any configurations that you do based or depending on ETH0 saying that, okay, it's always zero is my boot or zero is my primary, then that may have an impact when that uh, driver changes the numbering format to something else. And hence they came up with this logic. But in, in AWS, when you try to get virtual machines, you see still ETH0 concept, ETH0 and ETH1. So that's the background of this naming convention. And loopback adapter, everyone knows, that's where you use to test your network connectivity. So it basically connects within that, uh, you know, within that machine. And this is your switch, virtual switch, which can be disabled by default, it is enabled. So that's pretty much about the information that you see when you are saying IP config. Now, I have this uh, IP address and everything. Now, how do I connect to this box from outside the machine, outside this virtual machine or this physical mix? It could be, I mean, technically it is saying virtual machine because it's virtualized, but to any software, it is like a physical box. Now, if you want to connect to this box or to connect to this Unix box, you usually we use a tool called SSH tool. SSH is a protocol. So any tool that supports to connect via SSH can be used. Most of the times we use PuTTY is one software which is open source, but that is very, very basic. There's another tool called Mobile Xterm, which is really, I, I like that tool a lot because it's like one stop shop for most of the stuff that we really want to do. So if you go to the download, I always recommend people to install that mobile extern. I mean, if you want to do basic things, then feel free to use your putty. I mean, I'll go there and show. 
I mean, the name itself, you can search in the Google and you should be able to locate their homepage and you can uh, download the software. Softwares and get it download. Other, other uh, thing I was saying is, so this is a free, but under free, you have a few limitations, like you can have maximum 12 sessions and so on and so forth, but professional edition has a lot of things, but we can use this home edition and you can download. And once you download, it's just an exe file. There are two ways you can run this. One is in portable mode where you'll have just an exe file which you can execute whenever you want or installer where you'll have the leverage of configuring the settings and storing your connection methods and everything so that next time when you open it preserves that information. So it's up to you which download you want but those are the two ways. Uh, let me open that mobile exter. So in the mobile exter, let me maximize this. Okay. Now, as I said, SSH is the uh, means in order to connect to Unix box, any Unix, any Linux flavor per se. So you go to the session and configure your session. So SSH and the IP, IP address was was IP address we were seeing. 192, 168, 121. So I say my remote host is 192.168.1.21. You can specify a username that you want to connect. You can say root or you can say I created a user at the time of installation. So I'm trying to connect using that user. Uh, uh, here you can uh, uh, go and if you want to execute a command at the time of connection, you can do it or you can just log the and whatever the output that you're seeing on the terminal can be logged into a folder. So there are pretty much basic things that whatever you want, you can do. And now if I say, okay, now I can connect automatically. It will do an uh, connection to the my machine 192.168.121 using a user called HKS and it's asking me to enter the password. Now, as soon as I enter, I connect. Okay. Now that's how you connect. Now, technically speaking, I'm not directly uh, connecting, I mean, I'm not inside the, when, when I'm trying to, when I'm trying to connect to that box, I connected using an SSH uh, protocol, but this gives me pretty much command line interface access. You do not have graphical user interface access, but there are certain ways you can emulate that graphical user interface using Xterm, which need to be enabled. We'll see that later. I don't want to do that in this basic session, but I'll show like you can enable those things as well. From the host, you can enable, you can sh open up all the graphical user interface uh, dialog boxes so that you can uh, do all the necessary changes that you really need to do as a part of your configuration. But again, in Unix, the beauty of Unix is whatever you can do with the user interface can be done using the command lines and you can do more than what an user interface can do using command lines. Uh, now, probably I will just stick to the mobile XM and I can do all the activities that I really need to do from here. Uh, let me switch back here to the windows. So now within, once you connect to the CentOS flavor of Linux that we install, how do I go to this terminal window? So click the activities and you can see this terminal. And if you want to navigate all the applications that are installed as a part of this build is click this show all applications. And you can see all the applications that are built. Like this is the default browser that gets installed. If you want to browse, it's like a Windows Explorer where you see the cabinet, the files and a text editor like your notepad and some of the settings and software that you really want to install additionally. 
but to for most of the configuration that we really need to do is this is where you technically go to terminal and from terminal we can do whatever we can now in windows you have like a user that you have then you have an administrator user it is called elevated permissions whenever you are trying to install anything it will show a window dialog box a pop up box is you are trying to install this whether you want to configure yes or no in the same way in unix how do you install how do you configure how do you get the elevated permissions as a user it is called the command that we use in order to do any configuration changes or any installation that you really want to do or any updates that you want that you really want to apply as a user you cannot do you need an administrative users like a super user like a root root user root is usually called a super user in unix like administrator in windows so if you want to do such commands as a super user like as a root with a, you you can do that without even logging in as root one way is you can basically log out and log out so if you want from the graphical user interface if you want to log out and log back in now here you see the power off switch button so you can click this drop down this is like my two ethernet adapter that are connected three is my nat eight is my bridge you can configure this adapter like you can turn off you can turn on you can go here and do the changes that you really want to do as well whatever the configuration that you want to do i don't want to go much deeper here today i want to concentrate a little bit on the navigation of the unix box but this is where you can go and turn off turn on the configurations and change whatever you really need to do and all the changes that you apply here are applied only for that network adapter this is my uh, s03 adapter which is my nat and if you want to change the bridge one so you can go to s08 and you can change those settings okay. now here this is the logged in user this is the logged in user you can click this and you can say you can switch the user you can log out and you can change the account settings as there i want to switch the user to administrator so click switch user now let's say i want user not listed because i have never logged in using root so i will say root who is my administrator like technically i'm logging in as super user like a root now so next i enter the password See, here is logged in as privileged user, which is a super user. Now, any changes that I do technically will go and apply directly. It will not ask me any confirmation, saying that okay, do you want? Are you really want to install in this and all this? Because I am a super user, it deemed to understand that yes, you are the one, the super user. So I will accept saying that okay, yes, I'll go and execute the command. For example, it is not like you, you you cannot say update there is an yum update or it's an uh, package manager you will say yeah and you say m update what this does is it will up, go and update your operating system files anything the new releases that happened any new updates that came in any patches that came in can be applied using m update when you run this it will go and check all the details and say okay these are all the packages these are all the libraries that needs to be updated i'm not going to run this it's going to take a lot of time but to give an idea like what exactly it does now here it will say okay these are all the kernel new versions that came in and all the things that are getting upgraded everything and at the end it gives me a summary like total installs five packages total upgrades 106 do you want me to continue yes or no I'm, I'm, I'm not going to continue, but if, but this is an interactive, right? Like here you are saying I'm update. Now it is showing me and it's asking me a confirmation. But if you want to run this as an automated fashion where all the input should be taken granted that, okay, yes, go and continue because I know that there are updates which I need to apply. So don't wait for my confirmation because I, I gave this command. I'm busily working on different machine. And if I do not give any act, I mean, response here, it just stays there. It doesn't do the activity. In, in that scenario, what you do is hyphen Y. It will grant saying that, oh, okay, you are asking me to go ahead 
by taking the option as Y to continue the installation. Now we'll run the similar command with the regular user. So switch user. So I'll say HKS. And if you say, see, uh, how do you know to which user you are connected to? One way is here you see this one. Now, if I switch to the other user, I don't know whether you people have noticed or not. See, with the graphical user interface, other disadvantage is the time it takes to switch between the users. I will show you a different way how you can quickly switch to the users uh, using the terminal. So here you see the route. Right? This is how you do. Another way to tell is, who am I? It's a command, who am I? Which you tell me, yes, you are the root. Now, if you want to know who are all the people, people that are connected to this machine, just say who will give me. One is root, one is HKS. I'm having two sessions with HKS. One is within this machine, other one is from the mobile external. So if I exit from here, now if I do who, I see only one. Only two are active users, okay? So now let me switch back. Now here also same, who am I? The username or here as well you can see, but I would prefer this is based purely based on the configuration that you did as a part of your, uh, there is a file called bash profile, like a user profile, like a user default settings. In the same way in Unix also, you have a user default settings. All the settings are stored in a file called bash profile. I'll, I'll go there in a in few minutes, but uh, I don't want to uh, get distracted with the stuff that I really want to show, but there you can go and configure. However, if you are configuring such a way that to display something else other than what you want to show, like username at the rate, the machine that is being connected to, then the other means to technically look is who am I? And if you say who, it will display all the people who are connected to this machine. Okay. Now, if I try to issue the same command update to update the binary files or the uh, operating system files, what is it? M update this command has to be run with super user privilege under the root user on most systems. Okay, now let me say, now how do I run this command with an elevated super user privilege? There is something called S-U-D-O, sudo. Sudo means do the stuff, whatever I am providing here as a super user. Super user, do it and say, yeah, update. Now it is asking me the password, just like in a graphical user interface, you get the prompt, prompt, right? In Windows, like, yeah, do you want me to do yes or no? You're trying to do something. So I'll give my credentials. And it does the stuff. Same five packages, 106 updates. But anyways, I don't want to do this. So this is the way you can manage your control on the super users versus regular user. Now, if I want to, again, for some reasons, want to switch back to the super user, one way we were seeing, right? Click here, switch user. Other way is basically you can say super user and dash enter. Now you log in with the super user credentials. Now you see, there is a super user. Good. But now still I need to, if I want to switch back, I have to exit, I have to log out and again go back here. But if I want two active 
simultaneously side by side. So it's okay. You create one more terminal session, like another command prompt. New window. Okay. Now here you can say. You are both active. Here is your local. If I say HPS, good. You have both active. Simultaneously, you can do both activities. The same thing can be done from mobile extern as well. It is not that you have to be always on to the operating systems on the server. Okay, so what I could do is session, I'll say SSH 192.168.1.21. I will specify the user as root and say, okay. Here, I have two terminals open. And the beauty of this is, when you are open here, you have the graphical interface to do some basic activities like move the files, create the files, download the files and everything. And all the files that you see here are basically for this user specific nature. And if you, and it will show the entire uh, file exposure, the file cabinet of your entire Unix system, but technically you still cannot access them. For instance, if you're trying to go to a folder where you do not have an access, let's say, you're going to the root folder, basically like, like entire root C drive and trying to access some system files. And if you want to download or if you want to open those files, it will not allow you unless you have access to it. So if, if, if I say, okay, now I want to download this file. I can just drag and drop it onto your, onto your host machine. But technically it should not, it, it, will, it will stop me because I did not have permissions to do that. And it, it, it might say, take some time to, Get, get to that point. But if I go as a root, root will have permission, then I can download. Even there's a very small file is thinking, okay, do you, does this guy has permission or not? Now, if I go to the root, now if I go to, because now this Explorer window having the privileges as a root, and if I go here, you can see that, like if you hover on it, it'll show, it is giving some basic information if you notice. If you notice here, let me see, it says as bin is the file name, the size, the data on which it is created, the time at which created, root, root with some permissions. So I'll, I'll go over what those are, but technically this file is, who's the owner of this file is basically the root. Versus here, you are logged in as HKS and trying to access a root file. So it doesn't allow. Now let me cancel this. Now, for instance, if I go back to the home directory, slash HPS. Now, if I hover, it'll show me who is the owner. So these files I can download, for instance, if I want to download this, download done. See, I got the file here. Sorry, see, um, let me, just now, so this is the file that I downloaded. Any file that I really want to do, I can download. So for instance, if I want to download another file called Naveen or Nav9, I can drag and I can drop onto my desktop. It's downloaded. So the permissions are preserved still. Now as a root, if I go to home, HK, this is the location where I stored, root does not have access. And if root is trying to access this file, he can because he's a super user. Now on my desktop, I already have that file. It's saying, do you want to replace or do you want to, basically I'll say replace the file on the destination. So it got copied, okay? Since he's a super user. So that's the difference where you can see and you can activate multiple things. And if you want to have, Okay, within the root, you are doing like three parallel installations. You, you can have as many root sessions as you want. And in each session, you can perform your activity. This is like your own session. 
if if the, if this session gets disconnected other sessions are still active they are not disconnected now let me go back to the actual server okay. now let's say you are first time you installed this unix operating system and at the time of installation creating a user is recommended but it is not mandatory at the time of installation so one other way let's say uh, if... i have a question go ahead um so uh, you are showing the differences between the party and uh, the mm -hmm. mobile so basically we, we can use the win acp for window purpose like transferring the files Yes. Other than that, what is the big difference between the PuTTY and the mobile term? So in PuTTY, you do not have WinSCP. It's only for SSH connections. Whereas in mobile term, you see to the side, the, the, the browser files activity that you see is basically your WinSCP. So if you install PuTTY, you have to install WinSCP on top of it. It's all different, different ways or different, different tools that you can use to perform the activities. This is like, for instance, your main goal is just to connect to Unix box. You don't need any additional tools. You can go to command prompt mm -hmm. and you can say SSH at 192.168.1.0. Well, or 20, 21, I think, sorry. So 21, you can connect. You don't need any additional tools. Mm -hmm. However, if you, want, if, you, if you want to do some advanced activities, I want a flexible, it is, you, you just think like, what is the difference between Notepad, WordPad, MS Word? Notepad okay. is basic. WordPad is a little bit advanced than Notepad. MS Word is much more advanced than WordPad. Think in that way, like the options, the flexibility, the features that are provided are more when compared to other tools. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference. There is, it is not changing the way in which you are connecting to. Once you are connected, you can do everything that you can do in any of these tools. And uh, multi-execution, uh, did you tell that point? Yeah, I'll tell you. Multi-execution, I haven't gone. So multi-execution is uh, technically in mobile extern, the other additional feature, like an, it's, it's more used by administrators per se. Let's say I have like six sessions, like I have two sessions right here. Now, if I want to perform same command and both the sessions, like I have like six uh, sessions connected, let me, duplicate this session. We can do thing in party two, right? Like duplicate the session. No, 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 I'll show. There is one difference between that. The multi-execution is says, let me expand this. Now you have three separate sessions. In party, you'll duplicate the session. So you will get like two different windows. Think that window is like a tab. Now let's say if I want to execute a command call, list my files, but I want to list the files and all sessions simultaneously at the same time. Then you can say multi-execute and any command that I type, you see it is getting typed in all the sessions. Okay. okay. That's one advantage, but again, you can control that. Then it runs only on the two things. This is independent now. Okay, I can disable the terminal. Okay. Yes, whatever camera you want. And you can exit that from multi-session. That's interesting. Okay. okay. That, so these are all like advanced features that you can do. Now, if you have PuTTY, if you want to transfer the files, you have to open WinSCP. Again, you have to log in and do. But here, that login activity is already done as a part of your SSH session. So you can okay. go here and do whatever file. I mean, it is not just to download. You can upload the files as well. This secure file transfer protocol is nothing but your win SCP. Win is the Windows, like SCP is a secure file transfer protocol. It, it uses the same protocol. Putty is the tool name and you are connecting an SSH. Here also it's the same SSH, but you are using mobile external. Okay, 
So um, now, now let's say now you have the Unix machine, then you, you are the administrator. Now you want to create the users. So before even creating the users, we have to understand a few things. In Unix world, there is something called users and groups. Now, what is a user? What is a group? User is any person or it could be a machine or it could be a service account. It could be anything that it wants to connect to that box. But by default, any such ID, any such identity, any such user should belong to a, a group. A group is nothing but a set of users where you have like administrative group, development group, QA group, or DevOps group, or uh, Unix admins, uh, database admins, security admins. Those are all different types of groups, which has some set of permissions, or privileges tied to it. And any user that belongs to that group by default will get all those permissions. You don't need to again attach those permissions separately other than you want some additional special privileges or permissions that you want to assign to him. Okay. Now you can create users without any group. It is not mandatory that you have to create a group, but by default, every user should be tied to a group in Unix or any operating system. So what it does is it creates a group with that same username. Now, how do you know what the users are, what the groups are, how do you how to tell whether that group is created or not? There is a file called slash etc. This is where all the groups can be found. But how do you view the contents of the file? Use a command called cat. It'll display all the contents of the file. These are all some list of groups that are created as a part of the installation, but any use any group that you created will be displayed here in the same way. Now, how do you list the contents of the users? Unfortunately, it is not called users. It's called PASSWD. This is where you can see all the users that are available as a part of this operating system or in this machine. Now, in the graphical user interface, you can see really like users and groups, not like the file, but in, in, in an, a graphical manner. But I want to stick to the command interface, CLI interface. Now, how do I, uh, uh, how do I add a user? Now, as I said, the purpose of adding a user is basically in order to maintain or in order to grant other people to access to this machine. In Unix, it's a good, we have to say clear as clear. Uh, and again, to display any contents of a file, you can use command called cat. Another way to display the contents of the file is called vi. It's an editor, just like your notepad. So you, you can say slash etc slash group. Now it is like navigation where you can use arrow marks in order to navigate through the file. I will go a little bit deeper into the viator later once the user groups are done. Viator is technically an, uh, it's, it takes almost all one full session. So we'll go there later. Now, let me go to the users. Now, if I want to add a user, a user can be added only by super users like an administrative privileges. If you want to do via regular user account, then you should have permissions to perform those actions. Pseudo. I said pseudo, right? Like do the actions as a super user. Not every user will have privileges to do such activities. Then how do you know whether which user has this or which user can perform the administrative privileges? You can check that in the groups any user who is part of a group called wheel, it's called super user group, can perform 
administrative tasks. Now, how do they know whether I am part of that group or not? What you could say is cat, see? And you can search for wheel. Wheel is the super user. Yes, there is a user called HKS who is part of this group. It means he can perform the super user activities. And hence I can say sudo and give whatever commands I want, super user commands. In order to create a user, we use a command called add user, right? But the way the command goes is user add. User add is the command, not like add user. User add is the command. Now, user add, what is the name of the user? Let's say I want to give a name called, what? Nothing clicks in my mind, I'll say. Student five. Okay, click. Now it is asking me to provide the because you are running the command as sudo it is asking me the privileges i'll say enter the password and the user is created now let me list the group i told right if a user is added without any group then by default with the same username a group will be created because every user in unix should belong to a group it creates a group now in this file, you see another column called X. What is this X? X is nothing but the password. For groups, there is no passwords and hence it says X, nothing is there. Now, what is this number? Every group will have an ID called GID, group ID. And the ID of this group is 1002. In the similar fashion, for every use, there is an ID. For every user, there is an ID, user ID. For every user, there's a group. And how do I see that? You say cat slash etc. Student five credentials, user ID, group ID. Okay. Now, in addition to that, you are seeing some other information. What this tells is by default, the home directory of the user called student5 is slash home slash student5. And when he connects, by default, the shell to which he's connecting is bash. We can change all these defaults like in mobile X term. Globally, there is something that you can go and change the configuration so that any new sessions that you create will apply those global configurations like font size, font type, and all those things in the same way. In Unix also, you can change those. Like by default, whenever I create a user, what should be his home user account? What should be his home uh, default shell? All this, this we can change, we'll see later. But this is what the information that you can see. Now, when, I, when I'm trying to uh, list all this, it is listing me all the contents. And at the end, I'm seeing this because that's the latest user that got created. But let's say I created a few more users, but if I want to search, then I have to navigate through this file and find, right? But how do you search that content of this file? Because it's so big, how do you know? How can search for that? Because if it's like 10 lines, 50 lines, 100 lines, yes, based on the capacity of each human, they can search for some lines, they can scan through page of page one, but it's tedious, it's not that efficient. So there is something called grep. Global regular expression. Okay. So what it says is I'll say grep, I know I'm searching for student five, where you want me to search? It will show that specifically and directly. Okay. Now, uh, let me switch back here, the home directory. The home directory here, you see slash home slash student five, then you can see that. Now, how do you see that folder? How do you navigate to that folder? How do you list the files under that folder? All those things can be done using the command called ls. List my file. I mean, actually, ls means long listing of files. Then slash home student file. Permission denied. 
because who is the owner of this folder? Student file. But I logged in as HK. I am not the owner, hence I cannot see it. But I have wheel group, so I'll say sudo. There are nothing in this because I just create the user. It has no files containing in it. Now this student user is created. Now how do I log in as that user? I cannot log in at this point because I don't know the password yet. A password is not being set. Now, how do you set the password? Command is PASSWD student5. So, uh, one second. PASSWD student5. The problem is this is again an administrative command. So, I have to use sudo. Now, it is saying change the user for student file. This is a warning. It has a password dictionary, which tells, okay, your password should be always at least eight characters in length. And it should not be any common keywords that are easily guessed, that you can easily guess. But as a testing, I'm creating, so that should be fine. Okay, I did not type the second password, I think. Password has changed successfully. Now, how can I connect to this user? So you go to mobile action, new session, just say my SSH 192.168.1.21. Now, student 5 is asking me the password. Password. Logged in. Now, this student is logged in. Now, how do you know what is the home directory that he logged in for? In his default directory was slash home slash student five. Now, how do you see that? They say print working directory slash home slash student five. This is the working directory. This is his home working directory. Now, he can create all the files that he needs and everything from here. Now, as a user, if I say, who am I? Who? To show all the people who are connected. Okay, and it shows from where they are connected. All these connections are happening from a host machine. These two are my guest machine. Okay. Uh, now, okay, good. Now, if I want to change, uh, where did I create it? Okay. If I want to change, the, if I want to, so when a user is created, I said a group will also create, right? As a part of the user creation, if you want to specify his group as something else, then you have to use an option called hyphen G. So if I say, since I'm running this command as root, I don't need to say sudo because I'm already a super user. If you want to run as a regular user, then you have to use the command called sudo. So let me run it from here. User add, I want to make him as under a group called, for example, uh, class. And I want to create the user called. Now, if I say cat slash etc group, okay, group is already there, sorry, user password. Now you can see student three, the ID, but now here group ID is 500, which is nothing but the group of the class, class 500. Right. And of course the home directory and the default shell. How do you create the groups? Yeah, user, group, everything is good, but I want to set up my own setup. Like I want to have some new group to be created. I want to add the users to that group. Then there's a command called 
like just like how you have uh, uh, user add, you can say group add. So if you want to know the options, if you want to know more details about it in Unix, there is something called, you just specify the command and press enter. It will provide you all the options that are part of that command. Or there is another command called man. So it will give entire documentation of that. So here you can go and read everything. Of course, you see the same information in Google as well, but this is like specific documentation that is provided as a part of the version, the library version that you are using within the operating system. All this documentation. Okay. Any command, man, use rad. Now man, ls, like the listing that we did. Man, add and prints onto the standard output okay in in unix there are uh, uh, multiple ways where you can control the output that you want to display for any command that is for for instance if i say uh, cat slash etc as well. by default the output is onto the console onto the screen that's why you are seeing it. If you want to route this output to something else, you can concatenate. I mean, you can route that using this greater than symbol. If I say a.txt, everything is gone to this file. Okay, now if I say cat slash, you have all the content. But Let's go to the group. Group add, I want to add a group called probably test. A group is created. Now if I say slash, you see test and one or three. But if you want to specify your own ID, Test. I want to say 200 unless it is used. Oh, sorry. Test is already there. I'll say test file. Or maybe say DevOps. Created. Now, if you want to see the uh, details, Yep. DevOps X and the group ID is this. In Unix, Unix operating system is case sensitive. So if I say it's not for lowercase, uppercase is case, I mean basically it's two different entities. They are not same entities. Now, if I want to add a user to this group, say, I'll say user add. Uh, uh, student two, I hope student two may or may not exist, but we will see. It, it should throw an error if I have that. Then I'll say group is groups. Now, if I say cat slash etc, then two. Student two is part of group 200 and his home directory and has been. Remember that in Unix, every user has something called primary group and additional groups, secondary groups, alternate groups, all mean the same. Okay, here, his primary group is 
uh, the DevOps. Now, if we want to, now, now let me create the password for him. Student two. Interesting, good. Now I will log in as student two. Here I log in, SSH. Student two at the rate. <clears throat> Another way of connecting to a different user is you can use SSH command prompt uh, uh, 192.168.1.21. As testing. Now I know him. Now, if I try to say I'm trying to run administrative command, oh my, no student too. I'll say M update. Okay, this command has to run me super. Oh, okay. We trust it to receive the usual leg. I mean, this is giving an option. So I'll say, I'll try to make this as, uh, I'm, I'm trying to provide the password and see what happens. Is not in because he's not part of the wheel group. Now, how can I provide that super user privilege of the student too? So come here. Where did I create here, here, right? So I'll say, you can modify the user, which is called user mod. I'll say, hyphen, hyphen G is primary, additional groups, hyphen G, and I'll say, will. Oops, I had to specify the username. I did not specify the username. To who? Because I am saying, okay, add additional group called wheel, but to which user? I did not specify that. Student two. Then now if I say cat slash etc group, what is the group he belongs to? DevOps. Still, it shows the same thing. But if you say wheel, you'll see student. So all the people who are part of this wheel group will get appended at the end. So you can see that HKS, you student one and student, but you don't see student five, you don't see other users. Now as a student two, here I am student two, right? I'm student two, if I run the command, same command, M update. Oh. I have to just disconnect the session guys because the permissions are will not get applied unless you create a new session. So I'll connect. Now if I specify the Sodium update, it does it. Okay, good. So that's about users adding, granting primary group, the default groups, or you can grant and default prime, I mean, uh, customized primary group. You can add them to different, different groups, so on and so forth using those commands. And there is a lot more things that you can do. You can automate all those things using shell scripts, but if you want to know more details about any command, use the man or just, give that command and press enter, it will give all the options that are part of it. Okay, users, groups, well and good. Now, how do you create the files? How do you navigate the files? One basic command that I showed is ls, like list the files within that user, within that uh, uh, session. So you will use a command called ls. There are no files created. 
Now, how do you create a file? VI, editor, or you can say touch. I'll create a file called file one. A file is created. Now, if I say ls, I can see the file, but it's just showing me the file. But what is the properties of this file? When it was created, what permissions it has, information like when it was created, who all of the permissions and all those things. So then you have to say dash l is a long listing. Okay, permissions, then the file name to which group, when it was created, the size of the the size of the file and the file name. And if I say date, you see exactly today it got created July 25th, 1041 and a few seconds. Maybe it is not showing the seconds, maybe I created the 50th the second, and hence it is what it is. Yeah, uh, so I would definitely like to give a shout out because uh, we do all this in our day-to-day uh, -day life, but uh, for me, at least, I have never seen that such a detailed session. So, thank you so much. No problem. Yeah, thanks, Navin. I'm, I'm really enjoying every single uh, command you're typing, every single explanation you're putting.